and the rest of the Lafayette community will have access to it later. I'd now like to introduce our speakers from the Solidarity Center. Jennifer Bognar, class of 16, Kidan Kinney, class of 15, Nalisha Mehta, class of 98, and Jeff Wheeler, class of 16. They are all program officers at the Solidarity Center located in Washington, DC. I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Janine, and thank you to Lafayette for giving us this opportunity. Um, it's always an opportunity and a really great chance to just give back to the Lafayette community. And so um, just wanting us to kind of settle into today's session. And so I'm going to invite you, our audience, to think about what your life has been like since the pandemic began. For those of you who are currently working, how has your work life shifted? How has your home life changed? For our recent grads or students, how has life changed for you since the pandemic began? So just think about it for a moment. And now I want you to imagine, to think about if you were to be a Cambodian migrant worker who has temporarily moved to Thailand to work in a prestigious hotel. And this job allows you to send money back home so that you can send your children to school. You can take care of your extended family, including your aging parents. And also it provides you the funds that you can pay back the broker who helped you to secure this job. And so imagine that you showed up at the hotel one day and the doors were locked by chains. And you were notified in that moment that you were fired, that everybody in that hotel has been fired due to the pandemic. Now, the reason why you've been fired is not because of what they call the safety of its employees, but because the tourist industry has dried up. There's no tourism, and so there's no job for you at this hotel. But you cannot return home to Cambodia because you don't have the funds to return home. You owe a lot of money to your broker still. And so what you're stuck with is living in the same accommodations with other migrant workers, which is often equated to living almost like in a US jail, that tiny, that cramped, very little facilities. Think about the workers in the United States. What do you suppose has happened to the hotel workers in the United States? Or the migrant workers who work on farms in North Carolina? Or what about taxi drivers? Or what about teachers, professors? How has the pandemic impacted workers in the United States? Think about it for a moment. How has life changed for every worker globally and in the United States? And so today, my colleagues and also fellow Lafayette alumni, we're going to be talking about the effects of the pandemic on the global workforce. So my colleagues, as I mentioned, will be talking about more from a country and regional perspective. And I'm gonna just kind of take us through a few themes that will talk about the impact the pandemic has had on the global economy and on workers. So a little bit about the Solidarity Center, I guess I should talk a little bit about that first. So the Solidarity Center, which some of you I think have joined us because you're familiar with our organization, but for those of you who are new to the Solidarity Center, um, so we are a nonprofit organization based in Washington, DC. Um, we are the largest U.S. Um, international worker rights organization. So we have offices in 30 countries and we work in 60 countries. And our primary goal is really to work directly with workers and their labor unions, where we support their struggle for respect, fair wages, and better workplaces and a voice in the global economy. So I mentioned the word 
union. So labor union, also known as a trade union, is an organized association of workers. It could be in a workplace, a work site, or it could be workers from the same sector, profession. And a key element of unions is to build collective power and to have official rights and recognition to be able to negotiate the working conditions for the workers in that site. And so let's take us to the first slide where we talk about the majority of the global workforce, which is about 3.3 billion people currently. They're affected by full or partial workplace closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many are in low paid, low skilled occupations, including millions of migrant workers in the frontline jobs like healthcare, agriculture, day labor, where a sudden loss of income is devastating. So I mentioned a little bit about migrant workers. So migrant workers are workers who leave their home and either go from rural areas to the urban areas or from one country to another temporarily for the purpose of work. And what happens is that when migrant workers leave their home, they're often leaving their families behind. And so they're separated from their families throughout the entire time that they're working. And so I would like us to continue to talk about moving into how the pandemic has pushed more workers into poverty. So worldwide, 2 billion people work in the informal economy. So the informal economy is work that is not re regulated or protected by the state. There may not be a direct employer-employee relationship. There could be subcontracting. In the United States, sometimes they're considered to be like day laborers, but it also could just be someone who is not getting paid directly by their employer. It could be where they're working through an agency, or they could be a temporary worker, or in some instances, they might even be considered independently employed, although they still have to follow the rules and regulations of a bigger company. And so because of the pandemic, tens of millions of, of workers, primarily women who work in the informal economy and migrant workers. So women and migrant workers are two of the groups of people that are probably the most precarious in what we would consider a normal, works, normal global economy situation. So the pandemic is just causing them to fall deeper into poverty. And so this is a growing problem globally. And we're also seeing impacts that the pandemic has been having on unions. So just as in the United States, the pandemic has forced millions of people into their homes and out of their jobs, the International Labor Organization estimates that the equivalent of 195 million full-time jobs are going to be lost during the pandemic, if not more. And within this, 125 million in the Asia Pacific region, 22 million in Africa, and 29 million in the Americas. So unions are often the largest civil society organization in a country and are the primary defenders of worker rights. And one of the key things about unions that I really wanted to share with everyone is that unions are often the only form of democracy in some countries in practice. You know, there are some countries where democracy might be a namesake for the government, but when we see true democracy, sometimes labor unions are really the only visible form of that. And so what we're starting to see in the United States, but also globally, is that, um, you know, there's the, in countries where the labor movement already struggles against informalization and anti-union companies, the current supply chain interruptions and dramatic losses of members through furloughs and through firings, you know, we're finding out that workers who are members of unions are usually the first to be fired. You know, the pandemic has caused decades and decades of building power and rights on the job and has just rolled all that power back where unions are now you know, they're considered to be the key defense against exploitation. And they're right now we're seeing the biggest targets against losing their jobs. Because if you have unions, you have workers have a voice. And when workers have a voice, they're not going to just stay standing still when they're being exploited. And so a lot of governments and a lot of companies, multinational companies are using this as an opportunity to really break down the rights of workers by squashing unions first.
And so this is something that we've seen an increasing trend in um, globally because of the pandemic. And so, you know, there's an estimated 450 million people who work in global supply chains. You know, thinking about where your clothes are made, think about like every element that's needed to make one garment, one t-shirt, one pair of pants. And the majority of the, um, of the, you know, the workers in the global supply chain are facing a reduced income or job loss, often without notice, wages, or brand accountability as companies are canceling orders or halting production or refusing to pay for orders. And they're saying it's in the name of the pandemic. You know, they're saying it's because of the pandemic. But what we're also see showing here is that, the, you know, there's a fragility in globalization. You know, low work, low paid workers have no say and little recourse when multinational companies are making decisions that affect their lives. And so what's happening is the pandemic is just making it more visible, the imbalance of power between workers and multinational employers. And so what we're seeing is that this breakdown is going to continue as the pandemic continues. Because as we know, the pandemic is not going to go away in a day or two. And so what we're seeing is this is going to increase. And so one of the primary groups that has been targeted and is so greatly impacted are women workers. What we're seeing with women workers is that, you know, the crisis threatens to push back the limited gains that we've already made on gender equality. Women continue to be pushed further into poverty, are increasingly vulnerable to violence and lack equal participation in the labor force. You know, these were already problems and the pandemic is just making it a growing problem. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, and then what we're also no, starting to, to find evidence of is that um, based on, we're seeing an increase in gender-based violence. So gender-based violence could be where it's violence against a worker who, for their sexual identity, for their gender identity, for their race, for their religious um, practices. We're seeing an increase in violence against workers. And because of the pandemic, we're seeing a reduction in rule of law or labor law that would protect these workers in a general, in a more like, I don't know if we can call it a normal, you know, when we're in a normal times, because even during that time, these are groups of workers that are exploited and are, are in precarious situations, but we're just seeing the situation become exacerbated. And then what we're also seeing is that because unions are often viewed as the only form of democracy in practice in many countries, we're seeing that governments are using COVID-19 to limit workers' rights and voice. You know, they, they're starting to, you know, create laws that are allowing the negotiated contracts between the employers and unions to be um, disregarded, which is called a collective bargaining agreement. We're starting to see where labor law is loosening up and changing and there's and and the governments are saying that they're going to do away with certain forms of democratic practices in the name of protection and safety and health for its citizens but that doesn't protect the migrant workers and what it does is it takes away the power of workers from their hands and puts it in the hands of employers and in the hands of the government and so what we're seeing even more and more is that this is going to be an increasing trend if unions and um, worker rights organizations and human rights organizations don't push back globally. And so we're also noticing that the trend is that more than 30 countries have put into place measures to limit freedom of association, freedom of expression, which we've even witnessed in the United States, and that workers are being jailed for calling out worker rights violations. So think about it. In the middle of a pandemic, workers are being jailed. So they're being put into jail cells that are crowded and there's no way to protect them from health wise. And so what we're seeing is that it's just increasing the problems and workers are being targeted for that. And so we're also noticing that because democracy is being, um, is kind of in a vulnerable situation in a lot of countries, we're also seeing that news organizations are being um, limited and so we're seeing all forms of democracy really being kind of, you know, um, starting to get uh, put in a vulnerable situation in a lot of countries because 
there, the protections are reducing because laws are changing all in the name of the pandemic. And so we kind of feel like that the pandemic response of governments exposes the fragility of human rights and could lead to significant rollbacks in really hard fought and won civil and labor rights. And so now I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague to talk a little bit more from a country perspective of how we're seeing the impact of the pandemic on workers. Thank you, Nalisha. Again, my name is Kidan Kinney, and this evening I will be talking to you about the case of garment workers in Bangladesh. For those of us that might need a little bit of a refresher on where Bangladesh is, as you can see on this map, it is in between India and Myanmar. And on the next slide, you will find some basic information about the sector, the garment sector in Bangladesh. And you might be wondering what a ready-made garment is. A ready-made garment is also known as fast fashion. So you might have purchased these types of items at your nearest mall or your favorite online store. And if you look at your clothing tags, you can see where in the world they were produced. And as you can see on the slide, if we go back to the previous slide, you will see that there are 4 million garment workers in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, with this amount of garment workers, is the, one of the top four producers of garments in the world. So along with China and India and Vietnam, Bangladesh is one of the top garment exporters in the world. And Bangladesh is also accounting for 84% of garment exports. And so from these data figures, you can see that the garment sector is truly the backbone of the economy. To give you some numbers, the RMG sector earned around 34.14 billion in fiscal year 2018 to 2019. And in fiscal year 2019 to 2020, which just ended, uh, the figures declined by 18.84% to just 27.7 billion. So that's a direct impact of the uh, pandemic. And at the same time, there have been countless health and safety issues in garment factories with thousands of workers dying on the job due to factory fires and collapses, which is what this picture on the slide is referencing. I don't want to die for fashion. And on the next slide, you will see the impact of COVID on supply chain workers. So you might have seen some of these headlines in the news media that you can consume. And as you can see from these headlines, one of the biggest impacts of the pandemic on the global economy has truly been on the supply chain workers, which is what Nalisha talked about previously. And in Bangladesh, the livelihood of 4 million garment workers was suddenly threatened and disrupted truly overnight. And when countries around the world started instituting lockdowns in mid-March, as a response to the pandemic, many apparel brands and retailers began canceling or postponing orders that were already in production or ready to, ready to ship. And four months later, garment workers are still in a vulnerable situation as the cancellation of orders led to employers enacting mass layoffs and terminations, often without even providing their workers their owed wages or providing legally required severance pay or furlough pay. So these large scale cancellations worth about $3.18 billion and abrupt moves by brands destroyed and devastated the livelihoods of garment workers as many could not weather a sudden loss of income overnight. In response, factory owners and worker rights organizations have been making pleas and appealing to brands to honor their order commitments and pay for the orders that they made so that employers can pay their workers. This is obviously a very concerning situation, but on the next slide, we can talk about what the worker and union response has been. So unions and workers have truly been at the forefront of demanding owed wages for garment workers over the past few months in the pandemic. And Bangladesh shut down, had a government lockdown between March and April where the factories were also closed. And during this time, many workers were terminated without pay. As a response, union leaders immediately began negotiating with factory management to 
broker wage payments, get paid leave. And most factories reopened at the end of April and many workers returned to work in the midst of a pandemic in order to earn an income and provide for themselves and their families. So our trade union partners have led discussions and negotiations on the payment of wages with employers during the shutdown, as I previously mentioned. They've also been really involved in other actions. So as you can see on these pictures, they've led protests and demonstrations to demand owed wages. They've participated in negotiations to demand their legally owed severance payments. They've demanded maternity leave payments past due wages and continue to dialogue with factory management and brands due to the extremely large amount of terminations and layoffs and factory closures. So as factories have reopened and they've been able to catch up on their orders, the significant drop in demand has led to thousands of layoffs and terminations of garment workers. During this situation, union leaders have also been technically savvy. So they've used social media and other media outlets to appeal to brands and governments to provide support to workers. And there has been some success in getting brands to reverse course and commit to paying in full for all orders, as you might have seen in some of the media. However, there's still more than a dozen brands who have made no commitment to pay for their completed or in production orders. So you might be wondering about what the health and safety of workers is while working during the pandemic in factories where they're often forced to be in close proximity to their colleagues. And so as a result of this, our partners have been dialoguing with employers to demand adequate personnel protective equipment in order to reduce the risk of COVID-19 spread. Um, and so our partners have negotiated with management to get this PPE to provide hand sanitizer and to install hand washing facilities in factories to really limit the spread of the virus. So you might be wondering, this is all negative. Where are the unions really having a positive impact? Um, and during this really tough time, one of our partners managed to sign a really strong collective bargaining agreement in one of the largest factory garment factories in Bangladesh. And this agreement outlines adequate health protections for workers during the pandemic. At the same time, the majority of factories in Bangladesh are not providing PPE or implementing social distancing measures. So we remain concerned about the health and safety of thousands of workers, especially as the number of COVID cases continue to rise in the country. So to wrap up on the union response to the pandemic, the most pressing issue that unions and workers are facing right now is the mass layoffs and factory closures, as I mentioned before, due to the global demand for garments drastically decreasing over the past few weeks. So if we go to the next slide, we can talk about the future outlook. So as Nalisha mentioned earlier, the pandemic has revealed and expose the gross inequalities of globalization in the supply chains in which low paid workers, including garment and apparel work workers lack adequate recourse when crisis hits. And the first thing that global companies do when a crisis hits is to enact cost cutting measures. And that usually means cutting workers. At the same time, unions have been the main force in implementing protections and making measurable gains with management regarding health and safety protections. And generally, unions and worker rights organizations are the only mechanism to enforce labor law provisions and fight for job security and payment of wages. This picture on this slide shows one of the positive outcomes during the pandemic, and it is showing the conclusion of the signing of a really strong collective bargaining agreement that I mentioned earlier. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but our partners have had some victories in demanding safe, safe workplaces, owed wages, and job security. So that concludes my portion on the case of garment workers in Bangladesh. And now I would like to hand it off to my colleague, Jeff. Thanks very much, Kidan. Can everybody hear me well? Um, 
So my name is Jeff Wheeler and I work on the Solidarity Center's Eastern Europe and Central Asia team. And so as we move um, across the globe to another country, I'm also gonna shift to another economic sector where we've seen um, the data show that workers are at the highest risk of coming into contact with the virus, um, and that's healthcare workers. And so when I say healthcare workers, I mean, in, in addition to nurses and doctors, that also includes um, anybody who works at a hospital. So that can include lab technicians and clerical workers. It also includes the custodial staff and janitors. Um, it also includes EMTs and first responders. And by extension, it can also include people who work in elder care facilities or in some sort of home care capacity. So these are workers who are <clears throat> routinely in contact with people who are sick and injured, um, as well as working with populations that are already at very high risk of contracting the virus um, and suffering very uh, severe symptoms. So it's no surprise that very early on in the pandemic, there are um, reports of tens of thousands of healthcare workers who were testing positive for the coronavirus or exhibiting um, severe symptoms of the virus. Um, but what didn't always get attention was just the severe magnitude of the, the prevalence within the sector. So if you go to the next slide, um, that includes a couple of examples that I was able to find. Um, so from Mexico to Ukraine, to even here at home in the US, the percentage is somewhere around 20% or roughly one in five health of one in five of the cases that are reported um, to be that the CDC or the World Health Organization, um, roughly 20% are among healthcare workers, which is a staggering number and extremely concerning. Um, it's partly because healthcare workers do get tested regularly, and so they have more ready access to um, the, the tests than maybe people in the general population, so the number is going to be larger but it still represents the really significant danger that this virus poses to the people who are there to take care of others who do get sick. Um, so this is the reason that a lot of healthcare workers around the world are organizing and advocating that their health be protected very proactively and very intentionally. So this includes um, very loud and resounding calls for um, personal protective equipment. You might've heard as PPE. So that includes gloves, uh, face masks, face shields, it includes for healthcare workers, gowns, um, even slippers for their shoes because the virus can stay on their shoes if they're walking around the um, hospital floors. You might have seen videos online of healthcare workers um, putting on layers of these protective materials. Um, and early on in the pandemic, when the supplies were running short, many were using trash bags um, as just some sort of protection that they could have. Um, because a lot of this, the, the materials in these, these equipment are single use. They get thrown away as soon as they're done and they're immediately considered um, potentially contaminated. Um, so moving to the next slide, we have um, beyond the, the calls for PPE, there's also the concerns about what happens when healthcare workers do get sick. Because unfortunately, it is inevitable that some of the healthcare workers, no matter what steps they take, some of them are going to contract the virus and test positive and have symptoms. And so what happens to them after that, after they contract the virus, that's something that doesn't get the same media attention and can sometimes be a dirtier fight. Um, but we have, um, from one of our partners in the country of Serbia, we have a very hopeful um, example of a success story. So Serbia is this red country right here in Eastern Europe. Um, if you look at the, that cluster of small countries there, that's the former Yugoslavia that broke apart during the 1990s. Serbia is one of the successor states. As you can see, it's very close to Italy, which is that boot-shaped country in the Mediterranean, which was the first hotspot for the virus in Europe. It was very severe there. So shortly after the virus uh, was very prevalent in Italy, we started to see cases cropping up across Southeast Europe as well, including in Serbia. So I have a story from um, our partner, who, which has um, a, a union shop in one of the cities in Serbia. So Belgrade is the capital, but if you look on the map on the right, down towards the right, um, in the south of the country, there's a city called Nish, NIS. That's where this story comes from. So moving to the next slide, we have, um, so here's a story that was published in international media, so from a Serbian outlet, but in English. Um, that what the what was seen in the hospitals in niche so hospitals in serbia like in many countries are part of the public sector so they are run by the government 
And so um, when unions for nurses and doctors and other workers are negotiating terms, they're negotiating with the government. So very often um, the, the terms of their collective bargaining agreements are enshrined in law. Um, and everybody, every, every country's healthcare system is different. So in Serbia, um, when workers take sick leave, they get 75% of their pay automatically and they only have a certain number of sick days a year. And so what started to happen was that when healthcare workers were starting to test positive or show symptoms, or it was believed that they had been in contact while not wearing the proper gear and so they were at risk, um, their employers, the hospitals, were immediately putting them on to medical leave with this pay cut. And as we've seen across the world, it sometimes takes you weeks to recover from the virus. So a 75% pay isn't that bad if you're just taking a day off because you have the sniffles, or you need to take care of a sick kid. But if you're gonna be out of work for potentially several weeks, and if you might be um, you know, suffering additional health problems, if you might have trouble taking care of your kids during that time because they're at home from school, um, this arrangement can be extremely precarious for you. Um, so many workers started to immediately complain that this isn't, this isn't fair, this isn't going to work, this is not, um, you know, this isn't normal sick leave. And so uh, one of our union partners, their name is Nezabisnos, this is their logo here. Their name in Serbian means independence, and that's because they are proud of being an independent union that um, negotiates on behalf of their workers and is not allied with um, the government or the employers, it's its own entity. And so they are a union confederation, which is an organization that has several branches across the economy. And so this is their branch um, that represents healthcare workers specifically. And so the healthcare workers union as part of Nezabiznos picked up this case and said, you're right, this, or, or um, the workers within that union said, this is, this is not um, the way it should be going. So they looked for ways to, um, uh, to bring, to, to elevate these cases and the problems that it was, um, creating. So if going to the next slide, the workers through their union, they approached the Ministry of Health of Serbia, which is a sort of the Serbian equivalent of our, um, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. It's a cabinet within um, the executive branch of the government. It's, it's in charge of healthcare policy um, and is the, basically sort of uh, in charge of the employment of all the healthcare workers in the country. And so they were able to argue a cognitive shift and a legal shift and a political shift about how this virus is being treated in the hospitals. Because when you just, if, if you come down with a regular cold and you take a day off, that's your regular sick leave. But when you're working in the healthcare sector and you're encountering a virus during a global pandemic and this virus is very contagious, that isn't just sort of, you know, life happens. This is a workplace hazard, which means it's a risk that's endemic to the work that you are doing during this very, you know, difficult time in history. Um, and there's already, in many countries, there are already lists of diseases that qualify as workplace hazards. So, for example, HIV and tuberculosis TB. And so the healthcare union was arguing that the coronavirus needs to be put on that list. And healthcare workers who uh, contract the virus, by definition, as being exposed to workplace hazard, according to Serbian law, it's the government's, it's, it's the employer's responsibility to provide compensation to provide adequate leave and to provide um, support to their workers who encounter or who contract the virus as part of their work because it's part of the job. This is something that Serbian unions have been able to negotiate on a national level. And so the Ministry of Health agreed, yes, that is the way this, you know, that's legal precedent. That's the way this virus needs to be treated. So they enacted a national precedent that allowed healthcare workers to get 100% pay when they go on leave to make sure that the leave is not taking away from their medical leave that they're normally given in a year, um, as well as just to make sure that they're able to get the care that they need. And so that, that way they can go in quarantine. Um, they're not going to be taking the virus with them to work and potentially infecting other people. Um, they can stay you know, home and take care of themselves or, or seek um, their own medical care that they need. Um, so in addition to that, the union has also been raising workers' awareness about um, how to stay safe on the job. So here's also an advert um, or a promotional piece from the union to workers um, in Serbia, it says, keep the virus out of the hospital. Um, so that's just a quick, um, sort of a quick reminder with someone demonstrating the correct equipment to be wearing. Um, and that's because a union is also, you know, it's run by the workers and the union is there to keep the workers safe and it's how workers protect themselves as Nalisha said earlier. So this is also about making sure that workers are taking care of each other and making sure 
you know, building a culture of safety of everybody, make sure you're wearing your gowns, make sure you're wearing your equipment. We don't want anyone getting sick um, to the best of our ability. And so moving to one more slide, to bring this a little bit closer to home, this fight for adequate benefits and, and compensation for workers who get sick is happening all across the globe. And in, in many cases, it's happening in a patchwork arrangement. Um, but there are different actors that are involved, and many of them coming from organized labor, making sure that healthcare workers are protected, um, as well as other workers who are essential and maybe contracting the virus um, as part of their work. So, the, for example, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which came out, was um, signed into law earlier this year here in the US, that includes provisions that expands uh, medical leave for workers at certain employers who contract the virus so that doesn't come from their, their annual medical leave that they are um, allocated each year. And that, uh, that came about because of um, strong advocacy and organizing, <coughs> excuse me, from the United States own um, labor confederation. So the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, also typically called the AFL or the AFL-CIO. Um, and here's another example that I found from New York State. So the New York State branch of the AFL was also negotiating on behalf of public sector workers. So that's like USPS, uh, Metro Transit Authority in New York. Um, anybody who's employed by the state through some means is that if they if they're deemed essential and they contract the virus while on on, um, on the job, and if unfortunately they pass away, their family members are entitled to benefits because they contract the virus while at work. And so that's considered a line of duty benefit. And that's something, again, that un uh, workers and unions here in the United States have been able to negotiate. And so it's a reminder that employers, even hospitals, and even institutions that we do trust don't always think about these kinds of problems in advance. And so it's the, the importance of having um, workers being able to stand up for themselves and um, negotiate improved conditions and raise grievances and, and note problems that are happening so that they can address them, especially when we're in uncharted waters like a global pandemic. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our other colleague, Jennifer Bogner, to share another case study. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm Jen, I work in the Americas region at the Solidarity Center, and I wanna talk about who's putting our food on the table during the pandemic. In particular, who's putting the fresh produce on the table, which I think we're very privileged to still be able to have during the pandemic and to have in the first place. So you probably can think of the supply chain pretty easily. You know that you go to the grocery store to get your produce and you know there are people who work at the grocery store, who check you out at the cash register, who stock the shelves. You know they're employed by the Safeways and the Giants and the shop rates. Um, then you know that the food has to get there somehow. You know that there are truck drivers who bring the food to the store. Um, but I want to focus on the people who are cultivating the land, the farmers, the farm workers. Um, but first, just to touch on the, the grocery store workers and the transport workers, they have a working relationship that you probably understand pretty well. It's probably similar to what you know in your own experience. Um, it's considered formal sector jobs. They know who their employer is. They know what they're getting paid, what their schedule is, who their coworkers are. They get their benefits, their, their health care, their, um, they pay into a pension and everything through that employer. So they have a very traditional work experience for the most part. But if we think about the farm workers, they have a very different situation. And because of the way that their work is structured, the way that they um, have a very estranged relationship between their employer, with all the irregular irregularities, all of um, the, the situation they're in, the way that their work is structured, the way that they're contracted, makes them particularly vulnerable to exploitation. And so not to say that exploitation doesn't happen in the formal sector in, for grocery store workers, for transport workers, but I want to focus on the farm workers and why the way that they are employed makes them particularly vulnerable and how the pandemic is exposing why exactly that that's a flawed structure. So the farm workers who are specifically providing our produce, many of them come from the San Quintin Valley in Mexico. So next slide, on the next slide you could see exactly where that is. 
uh, very close to California, just a little bit south. Um, and there's about 80,000 farm workers who work for farms in San Quintin. And 80% of what they produce comes to the US market. Um, the rest of it mostly goes to Europe. So these workers um, move to San Quintin from their homes in southern Mexico, usually from Oaxaca, which I have highlighted on the map towards the bottom. So you could see it's quite a trek. Um, so they would be considered migrant workers, as Nalisha has said. Um, they leave their homes for four to six months at a time to come up to um, San Quintin to work the fields during the harvest season. And many of them are indigenous from indigenous groups from Mistec or Chiqui. And the workplaces in San Quintin are very unique. They're not um, your traditional farm as you may picture it in your head. They're industrial scale, they're massive and they're run in an industrial way, which makes it really hard um, for workers to have good and healthy working conditions. And so because of the, um, but the, the workers who are most vulnerable on these farms are those who are contracted by middlemen, by a broker. So these workers aren't directly employed by the, the companies who, who sell the strawberries. They're not employed by Driscoll and the others. There, um, they find their work through someone else who comes in um, so they could show up in San Quintin and um, find and this person will say, I have a job for you and they'll take them to the farm and they'll work there for the day. So often people will work in two to three different farms in a week. And so they're called day laborers because of that structure. And again, this structure makes things very difficult for them because they don't have the stability, they don't know who, they're not connected to a direct employer, they most of the time don't have a contract, they can't bargain collectively, um, and it's really easy for the companies that they end up producing for to create distance and not accept responsibility for the conditions that they work in. So on the next slide, okay. um, I want to talk about how the workers have been able to mobilize even despite those challenges. As we've been saying, the best way for workers to defend their rights is to work collectively and form a union. Uh, that's the only way that they could build the power they need to deal with these huge companies that have much more power than them. It's the only way to balance the power. But because of the situation the farm workers in, um, that's pretty difficult. But um, there's a new uh, union. It's very young, only a couple years old. And there's also a membership-based organization run by women. And these two organizations represent farm workers in the San Quintin Valley. And the Solidarity Center is working with both of them. So first is the National Independent Farm Workers Union, Sinta. And most recently, um, the Solidarity Center has been working to build the union itself. Um, as we've been saying, unions are sometimes the only democratic uh, like system or institution in a country. Um, Mexico has a history of not having independent democratic unions. They're very rare. So the Solidarity Center has spent a lot of energy in building this union, helping it to run democratic elections to properly and fully represent its workers, to be responsive to workers, to be a grassroots organization. Um, so most recently, we supported their first um, national election process where they brought in new leadership. They elected new leadership, but we helped with the transition. Uh, we brought in external observers from UCLA here in the US and from a local Mexican university. Um, and so that was a huge deal. We also helped in the drafting of their bylaws. Again, making sure that this is a union that is like truly democratic and representative. And that's also important, their bylaws, it helped them to come into compliance. This massive labor law reform that is happening in Mexico, which is really changing the game. Um, maybe we can get into that later. 
Uh, and the other organization is Moody, uh, which again, it's not directly, a, it's not exactly a trade union. It's a membership based organization where women farm workers um, can fight for their rights specifically as women and as indigenous women in the way that they are particularly vulnerable. And so the other um, aspect of the Solidarity Center's work with both of these organizations, um, besides their internal well-being, is how they relate to their members. So a lot of this is education. What are your rights? How do you defend for them? How do you submit complaints if you go to work and you, are, you experience harassment or violence or you don't have um, the protective equipment you need to do your job, any of those things. If there's wage theft, you're not getting paid what you're due. Um, a lot of what the Solidarity Center does is helping the unions to have um, that kind of education, bring that education to their workers. And we can move to the next slide to find out how the unions are doing those things, specifically during the pandemic. So the first, greatest demand. All of these demands were relevant before the pandemic, but are especially relevant now. The first one is the full implementation of health and safety protocols. This is a big deal for farm workers um, because of the pesticides and things that they work with. Just the nature of their job puts them in danger, much like what Jeff was saying for healthcare workers. Um, but they're essential workers, so there's also a lot of risk that they take on during the pandemic that they don't normally deal with. And so new legislation was passed, new standards um, regarding social distancing, protective, personal protective equipment, the PPE, and other things that companies are supposed to be providing their employees who are, who are working throughout the crisis. And workers have been reporting at over 40 um, agriculture companies in San Quintin that the employers are not meeting those state and federal standards. So the unions are working hard to collect those complaints and, and follow up with the relevant authorities to demand for um, change for them to be followed. The, um, the second point is full access to social protections. Again, um, this has been difficult for farm workers because they're easily exploitable. They're not direct employees. They're um, just the nature of the way that they're contracted makes it very easy for um, their exploitation. So they're often, they have legally mandated um, access to social protections. And this is something actually the labor movement had, had to push for, um, but it's still not being respected. Workers are often taken off of the social security roles for no reason, even though they were already registered and we had to fight for them to be registered for free. Um, and just to say social security in Mexico isn't just like pensions the way we think of it here, it's also your health insurance, it's like the whole package. So it's really important that healthcare or farm workers can get that now, especially in the pandemic, but that has been very difficult. Um, and then the last three are very important for all workers, freedom of association, because the easiest and best and most powerful way for workers to influence their workplace and make change is through their union. And so it is critical that they're able to freely form unions without intimidation or violence, which is an issue uh, for these farm workers. And they should be able to demonstrate freely. Sintha has had a lot of trouble with um, backlash for their demonstrations and for their freedom of speech, for exercising their freedom of speech and freedom of association. Of course, as always, decent wages is really important so that workers can provide for their families, especially now where, um, as everyone else was saying, a lot of jobs have been lost. It's likely that the farm workers are the only wage earners in their family, and it is, again, seasonal work. So it's really important that they earn a decent wage and finally, an end to violence against women. Um, Alicia also mentioned this at the beginning. It's a huge issue, especially for farm workers, again, because of the situation they're in, the lack of protections they have. It's very easy for, um, or it's very common that women are um, experience violence from 
their supervisor, someone with power over them in the workplace and in the world of work. And I want to make the make it very clear that all of these demands need to be um, addressed for all workers in the supply chain. That includes these farm workers. We want this for the workers in, at your Safeway and at your Giant. We want it for the transport workers. We want it for the farm workers. And so with the last slide, do I have a last slide? Or this is the last slide? <laughs> I think this is, okay. So I'm leading into Nalisha's next slide, but I, I just want to end with saying um, what I think the Mexico farm workers case really um, makes me think about is the gaps in, um, in our society, who's being left out. Um, the pandemic is exposing this and um, I knew this before that the farm workers were excluded from so many protections and were exploited, but I think the pandemic is making it very clear. So I invite you to think about um, the ways the system isn't working, the dangers of this type of relationship between employer and employee, which is becoming more and more the norm that workers don't know who their employer is or there is greater and greater distance between them and greater or less responsibility um, from the employer to the employee. So I hope you will think about that. And I'll, I'll pass it back on to Nalisha. Thank you, Jen. And so to close, you know, what we're looking at is that as the pandemic continues, you know, as COVID-19 continues to spread, union, what we, we feel is that unions and worker associations around the world, you know, they're going to continue and should continue to demand safe and healthy conditions for workers who must remain on the job. So a lot of the work that the Solidarity Center has really, we've had to shift uh, the direction of our work over the last five months where we're continuing to provide the support for workers and for their unions to demand the safe and healthy you know, conditions for their workplaces, especially those that are considered essential. And we're also really working with, um, right now, a lot of our work is working with workers and unions to ensure that they are com compensated during forced work closures and um, that they get compensated for the time not worked because it was not by choice that they're not working, it's because of a pandemic. And so Solidarity Center has been trying to address this through the union and worker associations that we continue to work with. So we kind of, you know, for us at the Solidarity Center, from, for most of us, our work has like doubled in actual work that we're doing now than even when we were able to travel and meet with workers directly. And so, because what we're trying to do is really address ways and find ways that we can ensure that they are compensated and not laid off because what's happening is workers are getting laid off mostly so that corporations can maintain their profits. And so for us, we've been working at really addressing it through labor law reform. So we have a rule law team that really addresses that. Um, I focus primarily on migration and human trafficking. And so the issues that we've been having to deal with is one, allowing workers to continue to work in a safe environment in their, in their countries of destination, but those that um, have no job and have to return home, that their, their governments, so we've been working with unions who advocate to their governments to bring the workers home without any cost to the worker. And so that's what we've also been addressing. But what we've also are finding out that there's increasing levels of racism and xenophobia against women, you know, healthcare workers, women, and also migrant workers, because there's a stigma that they are the spreaders of the virus. So also trying to do education around that so that um, these pockets, these groups of workers are not isolated or basically um, put into a form of like isolation or exile socially because of the jobs that they held. And so while we're continuing to deal with the immediacies of the pandemic, we also want to continue to work towards a future where workers are respected, protected, and empowered. Before the pandemic, this was also a struggle and we were starting to see progress. And so we don't want to be going backwards, but we feel that this is an opportunity to right the wrongs that have been occurring pre-pandemic. 
Um, and so we strongly believe that workers have the right to be at the table where decisions that affect them are made, that they have the ability and should have the right to be able to negotiate. And, you know, one of the reasons why the Solidarity Center advocates for unions as one of the key structures to, to do this is because no worker should feel alone in their fight for their rights. No worker should feel that they are a target without any support. And so that's why we talk so much about building collective action and collective power. And so as we look forward, we want to see this not as a complete devastation, but really to have a vision of where do we go from here. And so we really want to work towards having a new social contract that ensures powerful institutions for the working class to ensure adequate wages, health and safety, and fundamental rights, and then full equality and universal social protections. Jen had talked about social protections for the workers in uh, Mexico, and then an end to systems that exploit workers and entrench poverty, including exploitative supply chains, which um, Jen and Kidan both addressed, and then a stronger, more participative participative democracies that embrace the rule of law. And so um, at the Solidarity Center, we do work with unions in addressing um, rule of law as it comes to laws that protect and don't protect workers, especially uh, women, migrant workers, and, uh, com and workers that come from communities that may um, create xenophobic feelings. And so that's why um, we really are looking at rule of law, we're looking at the grassroots level of continuing to help workers organize and also um, addressing issues of like bringing systematic changes from a policy level. And so um, this is kind of where we wanted to open it up to all of you who've been listening in for the last hour to open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I uh, while we're waiting for any folks to pop up with questions, I actually had a few questions that, came, that uh, I thought of during your presentation. One, I was curious, um, how much pushback do you get from governments, being that you are a US-based organization trying to organize labor in their countries, um, and has that increased with what seems to be an increase in animosity between some countries nowadays, particularly towards the US? Um, and then my second question is, how can we as Americans support workers, not only here, but globally? So two very good questions. Any of my colleagues wanna take that or part of it? I guess I'm not seeing anyone come off of mute, so I guess that leaves it to me. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I should mention is that, you know, the four of us, you know, um, Jen, Kidon, and Jeff, were all former interns at the Solidarity Center, so when they were Lafayette students. And so I feel like we're in that moment where they're looking at their internship coordinator, be like, hey, you answer the question for us. <laughs> um, but um, if you could uh, repeat the two questions. I saw the first one was really about, is it about, how do we address it as there's a building animosity toward between countries, particularly the United States? Um, is that the first part of the question? Yes. Okay. So, so one of the, you know, one of the, our common, I guess the way that the Solidarity Center approaches our work is that we never, like, we don't have the approach of, oh, we're here. We are the Americans. We're coming into your country to try to help save or fix things. That is the wrong way to approach really trying to bring about transformative, you know, transformation when we're talking about breaking down, you know, decades of problems within a workplace. It's always about working in collaboration with a group of workers who are based there, the workers who work in that work site, and really empowering and building their capacity. And so if it's to form a union, it's giving, it's really helping to build their capacity around forming unions and letting and having them take the lead. And so as an American organization, we're very careful not to be standing at the front, to be getting the credit for the change. It's really about the workers fighting for their rights. And so for us, it's about giving them resources, tools, but ultimately they're the ones who are seen as the ones who are building the power amongst the workers. Um, of course, we will support them with, as I said, technical assistance and resources and also just guidance, because this is new territory for them. 
Um, and so that's our approach is really to work in collaboration and partnership. It's truly about partnership with workers, with unions. Um, we've worked with human rights organizations. We've worked with other, you know, organizations that have similar goals as we do, but may not necessarily have a union background like um, that we focus on. And so it's really about collaboration, partnership, and we don't go in with a cookie cutter approach. It's always about really looking at what are the needs. And so we do a lot of research, a lot of interviews, a lot of on the ground work before we actually can figure out what is the best approach. And, um, and so, yes, of course, you know, there's during the pandemic, there's a little bit of an animosity against Americans for reasons around the virus, but um, you know, we've had to do a lot of things remotely right now. Um, uh, where our offices are based, a lot of our, you know, our staff are continuing to work remotely. And so we've been trying to address and continue the work and build power remotely, but we also have staff who are on the ground, continue to be on the ground there, who are being very cautious and, and careful about how they work with the unions, both physically, but also in terms of how are we adjusting because the pandemic has put us in a new arena. Um, and then the second part of your question, if you can remind me, Janine, what the second part of the question was. Sure. Okay. So the, second, the second part was, how do we, how does a person, um, a consumer, support workers both here in the U.S. Um, and outside of the country? Uh, I'm also thinking of this in light of environmental and sustainability. <laughs> so it kind of all ties in together, but also, you know, how do how do you ensure that your garment that you're purchasing is coming from a place that, you know, the workers were treated fairly, et cetera, or that might be too hard to do or impossible. I don't know. Uh, any of my colleagues want to start that? Jen, go right ahead. I can try that. Um, as you hinted at, Janine, I think it's you'd be really hard pressed to find a company that is completely like trustworthy hasn't gotten their hands dirty. So I, as a consumer, wouldn't suggest that you try to focus where you're buying your things. Um, I think it's more worthwhile to put your energy towards fighting for freedom of association so that unions can build and grow and that workers can have a voice and fight for their rights. Um, it's very overwhelming to think of like, how do we give workers what they need? It, it feels for me a lot more relaxing to say like, let's put our resources into helping those organizations build and the, the workers know what they need. They know what they want to fight for. So we just need to build those organizations. And so I'd also say any anti-racism work, um, anti-xenophobia, that's all really important to workers because the workers who are being exploited are workers of color, of religious minorities, are women. And so um, fighting for their rights and so that their voices can be heard um, without violence, without, you know, that they could freely voice their opinions and fight for their rights. I think that's where I would put my energy. Yeah. And there are some, oh. Sorry, Jane, if I could add, um, yeah. totally agree with everything that Nalisha and Jen have said. Um, but during over the past few months where uh, brands have canceled their orders, consumers have in some ways been influential in getting brands to reverse their decision to cancel their order. So through people speaking up and using their various different types of platform, um, that kind of collective power has led to some great uh, decisions being reversed by brands, which has enabled suppliers to receive their owed wages and in turn pay their workers. Yeah. And I think I'd also like to add really quickly, um, just piling on, um, that we at the Solidarity Center, we see ourselves as part of a global labor movement. And we know that's how our partners see us as well. That's how they see themselves. Um, no time like a pandemic to show that the world is flat, quote unquote, because it's, you know, it's affecting us the same way it's happening everywhere else. And many of our union partners would also point out that we have very low union density in the U.S. Um, and we as um, labor activists. We're members of our own union. Um, we follow very closely the uh, developments of the U.S. labor movement, and so we see ourselves as part of this interconnected movement where it can be, you know, as my colleagues have been saying, it's, you know, there's really nothing that we can do to fix a problem halfway around the world, but we can look closer to home. Where are the problems that we can fix here? And that can be about the way that you 
interact with um, essential workers that you see when you have to go to the grocery store. It could be making sure that you wear your mask, make sure that you wash your hands, make sure that you are keeping people safe um, while you're doing the daily, the daily business that you have to do. It's because we're all in this together. Great, good tips, good to know. Um, I see we have a few questions here. Um, Mark Mulligan has a question for Jen. Has the pandemic changed employment opportunities for workers on the Mexican farms? From what I've heard, demand for produce has ebbed and flowed. Was curious what effect this has had on the farm workers. Hi, Mark. <laughs> um, that's a good question. To be honest, I'm very like hyper focused on that one local union. So I haven't really, I don't have a full picture and I don't want to pretend like I do, but I will say that I don't think, um, my impression is it isn't the same kind of like devastating unemployment, um, like change in supply as in garment. Cause like, I also work on Haiti and like Kidan was saying, like, I think it's pretty fair to say that all of the garment sourcing countries, uh, workers are facing really hard times. They've not been making full wages. They're, a lot are losing their jobs. So I don't think farm workers are experiencing that in the same way, which isn't to say they aren't. But I think manufacturing is really where those kinds of problems are right now. And if I can add to that, um, what we're seeing though, also in addition to what Jen's saying is, it might be not the massive amounts of job loss, even though there is, it's also about how to keep the workers safe during a pandemic while they continue to work. And that is something that we continue to grapple with um, in all, all the countries that we where workers are working in the ag agriculture sector. And so that is something that has been a growing concern because it's it spread so quickly among on the farms. Another question, this is from Ellen Weiler. How many millions or billions of dollars do companies like Driscoll, the strawberry um, producer, save by hiring day or migrant workers through brokers and not hiring them directly? How much more would it cost the consumer to buy a product that was produced or procured by a worker directly employed by the company with all attendant benefits and rights therein? I'll say, that's a very interesting question. It's so hard to get that information, which is part of the problem is companies are not trying to be transparent. They're not trying to make clear what they're doing, who they employ. So like even figuring out who workers are eventually working for is like hard enough in itself. And one of the, I guess, technical capacity building the Solidarity Center has been doing in recent years, this is kind of like a newer concept, but is the idea of corporate research and like trying to learn things like that and dig in and figure out um, how, getting information that they can leverage with the company. And it's very hard to do. I mean, especially with the farm workers, they're a very young union. They're in constant danger of retaliation. Like that's not something they're able to think about yet. There are other unions who are able to think that way and to try to get that information and um, it's very empowering, but we're not there yet. Uh, if I can also yeah. ahead, add on to it, kind of um, bring it into a broader context um, or, or other thinking of other examples. We see this as well in Eastern Europe, um, not just in Serbia, but also in Ukraine um, and other countries in that region not just agriculture, but also um, like extractive industries and mining is very often cost is used as a reason of why wages can't be higher. This is supply and demand. But when unions and workers are able to get to the negotiating table and say, this is, these are our demands. Um, and very often, and very often unions in our, in the Eastern Europe region benefit from having um, stronger labor protections in their, in their um, legal histories so that their, their actions and their protests are more protected. Um, that when they, they take action and say, we're going to strike, we're going to protest and, and companies um, acquiesce, sometimes workers get, you know, 20, 50, even 100% raises in their wages or they get back pay from six months they have been paid. Um, and, you know, I'm not an expert on the international um, supply chains and, and the pricing and all of that, but um, that all can happen without a dramatic change 
um, in the store prices that we'll see on the shelves or when you're getting gasoline or anything like that, which I think the question was asking about is that these kinds of things can happen without completely upending an industry. It's about negotiations. And something I can add to what Jen and Jeff were saying is a good question to ask actually is how much is like the CEO of that company actually making? Okay, for every carton of strawberries that's sold, what percentage goes to the worker who picked it, the worker who packaged it, the worker who put the label on it, and then what percentage is this is the company actually profiting from? And so the the consumer may not actually get a bump up in price if the employer would take a smaller percentage and allow that to, to go towards the workers. And so it's really about, and so this is what we're starting to explore, like Jen was talking about with corporate research, is to really see what the difference is in how much you know, the CEO of a company would make versus the strawberry picker. And is it considered to be a fair wage? And if the CEO were to get you know, get half of what they're actually earning from a carton of strawberries, that would not fall onto the consumer. It would actually benefit the worker and it would still be a profit for the company. And so that's, so those are the type of things that we're asking the questions and exploring, but it is challenging because the books don't always tell the story and the research that's public, the information that's public doesn't always tell us the full story, but it's something that unions have been addressing and have been working towards this corporate research like Jen was talking about. We have another question from Jillian Andres Rothschilds, class of 16. Great presentation. I'd like how you've touched on multiple industries. Do any of you have insight on unions related to education? I've been seeing educators in America, particularly K-12 schools, voicing frustration over workplace protections over schools reopening. Are educators facing similar struggles globally? Um, I can answer that and I'll bring in Nalisha for this as well because Nalisha came to help us um, with the Eastern Europe team. We have um, two union partners in the country of Albania, which is in the same part of Europe as Serbia. It's just a little bit south of there on the coast next to Greece. Um, so we have two teachers unions that represent together, I believe about 65 to 70% of educators in the country. So including everything from pre-K to um, primary and secondary school and to higher ed. Um, and we actually brought in Nalisha because Nalisha is a Zoom expert. Um, teachers were having troubles that they, they were all sent uh, to remote learning, um, but they didn't have the proper tools to not just have meetings and work with their, their teams and their, their school systems, but to teach their kids in general. So um, because Nalisha's experience in teaching people how to use Zoom, um, including us, her colleagues, uh, we brought her in to show them how to use Zoom as a tool for uh, conducting your lessons um, and encouraging interaction among your students. Um, but we also see that in addition to the, the challenges that teachers have in doing their basic jobs, um, you know, they're very often passing on these um, additional concerns that they have about their students in the communities that many students, um, especially from lower income communities, don't have access to the right technology at home. Um, they often don't have the supplies. They, they aren't able to participate in the same way some of their other co classmates are. Um, and that can particularly happen in um, the marginalized and, and disenfranchised communities that are already precarious. So um, in Europe, one of the big groups that this happens to is the Roma community, which is an ethnic minority across much of um, Western, Central and, and Eastern Europe, um, who've been left out of many different types of formal employment uh, and have been left behind by a lot of state systems and very often they, they don't have the funds to pull together for um, you know, a laptop computer that can connect to Zoom. So that's something that the unions are also bringing up from their communities and saying, you know, there are deeper problems that I want to advocate for as a teacher and as um, a worker. So uh, Nalisha, did you want to add anything about your experience with those teachers? Yeah, so it was interesting. This was about probably about a month ago. I was asked to provide Zoom training to just like 20, I was told 20 teachers from the two unions. And I was like, okay, great. It's going to be done in Albanian. So simultaneous interpretation through Zoom. And 70 teachers showed up, including both union presidents. And it was interesting, the, question, the questions they were asking were really because their schools were not providing the, 
did not have a system in place of how to do remote learning. And so the teachers were working through their unions to get the training because their schools were not providing it. And so the training that I provided was to teach them how to really use Zoom for their own meetings and their own interactive learning, but also how do you engage children? How do you engage you know, elementary level school children? And how accessible is Zoom? And it was really about working through the unions to create a system amongst the teachers. And so in the United States, you know, we're seeing that there's so many struggles of, you know, whether teachers can return back to school, if school ch children can be taught remotely or in person. And it's been the unions that have had the loudest voice about whether or not enough safety mechanisms have been put in place or if it's just deemed not safe. And so sometimes it's the union structures that actually provide the loudest voice where work teachers don't have to be afraid to say, I don't feel safe going back and also providing the training tools to be able to move learning into a remote situation. But I have to say that this was a first for me to do that for the, you know, for 70 teachers to teach them Zoom so that they could actually teach their children. And I found that to be such, you know, transformative, but also it was eye-opening to the struggles that teachers are going through that a lot of us don't, didn't even realize what was happening, but it's such a key, um, a key need during the pandemic. Another question here, Bruce Keller, class of 16. How do you make sustainable unions? It seemed to me that the source of the current problem has to do with the power shift to the employer during an, during an economic downturn. In addition, how do you prevent an employer from exploiting a new labor market instead of cooperating with the union in the long term? I could start us. Uh, this is, I think, part of the reason the Solidarity Center feels like we need to exist is that workers gain a lot of power when they show up for each other, when they're connected, when um, they find a shared employer and work together um, and make sure the employer, like you said, can't just jump to the next cheapest labor. We don't want there to be a cheapest labor. We want to raise standards for everybody. And so there's an incentive um, amongst all the unions to work together and, and they realize it. And so a lot of the work that the Solidarity Center does is making those connections. Like um, the garment workers in Haiti benefit from solidarity from uh, the garment workers in Bangladesh. The AFL-CIO has showed up for the Haiti garment workers during this crisis. Um, there's a lot of ways that um, we work together to prevent that from happening. And a lot of this also happens around trade agreements. I didn't, I said I, I wouldn't get into Mexico, but there's um, a new trade agreement you're probably familiar with NAFTA um, which was the trade agreement between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and now there's a second version of it, the USMCA. Um, but the unions have been fighting for specific standards to be integrated into that trade agreement to prevent that from happening, um, that all the industries that are connected in this trade agreement, that they're, they're held to the same standards so that the employers can't just jump to the next cheapest market. If I can just add, um, I mean, it depends on what the labor context is in the countries that we work in. So we can do, you know, as many labor rights trainings and workshops as we want. But if the condition in the country is hostile to labor, or the, in the example of Bangladesh, the garment uh, supplier factory owners are connected to cabinet owners who have a direct government cabinet um, sec secretaries where they have a direct role in enacting labor laws. There's just a lot of complicated and um, nuanced things that can make helping to create sustainable unions really challenging. Um, so I, I think sometimes if the government or labor um, environment is hostile or anti-union, it really makes the work of helping to create sustainable unions that much harder. And um, if I can add to that, you know, and it also takes us back to one of the first questions is like, what can we do? 
you know, public pressure also is um, very powerful. Social media, um, putting pressure, because no brand wants to be shamed. You know, no brand wants to be seen as the worst of the worst. And so, you know, even though as Solidarity Center, you know, we cannot shame companies um, based on the way that we're structured and our funding mechanisms, but the public can. You know, um, we're often asked, well, what is it we can do as a, like, you know, just as a citizen of the United States, what is it I can do to help workers in Bangladesh? It's about using your social media platforms to bring, to bring light to what's happening. And so that kind of pressure also can help support workers. Like Jen talked about the networks of unions with unions. And we also work with networks of, you know, other coalitions. We work through the United Nations um, agencies and structures. But then there's also just people caring about what's happening and making it known and building just a public campaign around it. And social media has made such impacts in that as well. And so there's so many different ways that, you know, yes, we, there is a lot of hostility towards unions in many countries, but there's, a ways, there's ways to build power, especially during a pandemic, because everybody's on social media. And so that was just one thing that we've noticed and also that um, is growing. And I think, Jeff, you wanted to say something? Um, I don't think so, but I do have something I can add. Um, one example of where this has been really effective is in Central Asia. Uh, if people are familiar with the country of Uzbekistan, um, one of the stands um, sort of in between Eastern Europe and where China is. Um, sorry if you can hear the thunder. There's a storm in DC right now. Um, that um, Uzbekistan and some of the surrounding countries very often use forced labor. Um, we're often corralling um, workers um, or uh, pub public sector workers, people in other sectors in to go pick cotton um, to fill a national annual quota for cotton that then goes to Bangladesh and other parts of South Asia for making those garments. Um, and in the past five years or so, there's been a lot of international mobilization and awareness raising around that forced labor, where a lot of brands signed on to a boycott agreement saying, we will not purchase Uzbekistan cotton until you remove these symptoms of forced labor, you know, until you build a better system. Um, and while that, um, you know, part of, and part of our work as the Solidarity Center has been helping um, local partners and um, the unions that can exist to monitor that system and report on when the country makes changes or reforms, is, is it effective? And so we've actually been able to help lead some research on that and get some surveys and um, hear reports from workers. And so while the problem isn't gone yet, it has gotten significantly better because of that pressure, because it's hitting Uzbekistan in a place where if no one's going to buy this cotton, you know, that's you need to reform the system if you want to sell the cotton. Well, thank you so much. I think, I think that was all the questions that we had. I think it was very enlightening. Um, I want to thank Jen, Kidan, Nalisha, and Jeff for this very informative talk. Um, I do hope that you all join us for our next two events, virtual events. One is the DC Networking Night. Um, we really encourage folks, um, either students, parents, or alumni who live or work in the DC area to join us for that. That is on Monday evening. Um, registration closes on Sunday evening, so we ask you to, to register um, by that time. Um, and I think Nalisha has a little something to say about, about <laughs> DC networking. <laughs> and yes. So, um, so one of the roles that, you know, so I, first of all, I have to say that, uh, my colleagues here on the panel with me are very involved in the DC alumni chapter. And so, and I have, um, served as the co-chair, Ooh, the thunder, sorry, the coach, <laughs> that was really loud. So the Nalisha coach and I live very close together. Yes, so we can hear, <laughs> and Jen. So I, I serve as the co-chair of the Alumni Council for the Career Center. And one of the things for any of our students and also grad, recent grads that are on this, um, in this meeting with us, to really utilize um, your career counselors to help you kind of, you know, figure out that next step. Uh, this is actually how Jen, Kidan, and Jeff came to meet me was actually through their, you know, their, their, uh, through the Career Center when they were all students and also to really utilize your networks 
and DC networking night, I know it's going to be done a little differently because it's remote and it's virtual, but it's such an opportunity to build your networks, especially for those recent grads that are still looking for jobs, trying to figure out that next step. Take this opportunity, you know, talk with alumni. Alumni, one thing we love to do is we love to talk about ourselves. <laughs> and so take that opportunity to really build your network up and take opportunities like these, um, these forums and really just, you know, make best use of this time because it's, you know, um, it's the best time to do this, really. And so uh, hopefully we'll all see all the students that are on this call to, on, on Monday to join us for uh, DC Networking Night. We also encourage alumni on the call to, to participate as well. We're, we will be having breakout sessions um, by industry, and we also have um, about five uh, alumni who are very notable in, the in their fields to serve as panelists. So we look forward to seeing folks there. Um, another event that's coming up on August 4th, which is another Connect Ed event, and that's with Professor Don Miller discussing his award-winning book, Vicksburg Grants Campaign That Broke the Confederacy. Um, you can view and register for both of these events as well as other events at leopardlink.lafayette.edu. And we look forward to seeing you at our next events. I just wanted, I don't know if you guys all saw in the chat there, um, there's the link that Jen put in there <laughs> for the DC Networking Night. Thank you so much, Jen. And um, quite a few thank yous um, for your presentation. Um, everyone appeared to really enjoy it, so, and so did I. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Have a good night. <laughs>